I see that my space has been overtaken by all kinds of technology that I don't understand. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I am Ian with Full Throttle Battery. Not Buggy Whips. Not Buggy Whip. No. <laughs> yeah. Sick hat, though. <laughs> nice product placement there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, we are back in the studio for what first time in, I don't know, how long? Two months. <laughs> Two months ago, we did the Can Am show. So it's oh, been geez. a minute. Yeah. yeah. It's been a hot minute. Yeah. We've been up to nothing. I mean, I've been sleeping the whole time. I don't know about you. I can't, my brain won't even allow me to come up with a uh, <laughs> You a need thing. some sleep is what I think oh, you needed. It's insane. Yeah. Let's Fair do enough. this. How about this? Yeah. How about we just do a little recap of the TakeOver Tour since that was been the biggest show of the year, the, all four events happening all year long. Why don't we confine Labor Day to today inside of two minutes? Go. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. Yeah. Um, no, it's been a busy year for sure. Uh, and we're getting towards the end of the year. I mean, shoot, we're in it's, November. Right, right. We're gonna Isn't blink. that crazy to think about that we're in November? We're going to blink and it's going to be Christmas. I, and, I, and then we're going to be at Goons in the Dunes. And, <laughs> it's going to be crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm so busy with, you know, recapping the year with all the content and then, you know, just all the products I got going on around here as well and, and everything. So my hours are all allocated. And if <laughs> something doesn't line up, all of a sudden everything becomes a snowball. For sure. For sure. And I know you're in the same boat. You got tons of phone calls and stuff you're on as well. You know, there's some really cool stuff in the pipe right now, though. So I'm excited about it. And I mean, obviously, when you have a minute, we, uh, when I, and I mean it, when Zach and I have a minute, like literally today will be the first time Zach and I have been around each other 10 minutes or longer in two months. And I mean, even at Takeover Utah, we weren't together for more than five minutes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think the longest I was around you is when I stole your car to go to the short the short course. Oh yeah, I couldn't help but <laughs> I, I couldn't help but notice you were caught ripping it too. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Daddy for capturing a picture know, of me. Right? Yeah. No, they, they, we wanted to get it out there where people could see it, and you guys full throttle, you know, sponsored that that race setup, so that was uh, pretty awesome. And you guys were at the event. So let's talk a little bit. We went through uh, Oregon. Obviously, everybody knows Oregon. That's the OG takeover event. Right. Um, always a great time. Um, you know, I think that uh, vendors selling out of products the day before we even opened is a testament to that event. That was insane. Yeah, we, we, we did cover that a little bit there, though. But Coos Bay was nuts. And uh, it, Coos Bay was so nuts. And I think everybody knows it's going to continue to be that way that media priorities and the things that we want to accomplish while we're there on site, you almost have to have that stuff drafted a month in advance and still go to that event, understanding that any given curveball could take you out yep. for a day yep. and you don't get anything. That show is so busy. It's ridiculous. I think the um, seeing the camera cars out there this year was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing some of the, you know, other players in the industry coming out that haven't traditionally been there, you know, yeah. seeing Russ come out and um, a lot of the different brands that, you know, have always heard about TakeOver but never been there uh, showing up and, and partaking and, and seeing what it was all about, I think, was a good a good thing. And uh, that continued through all the locations, really, even Virginia, which is a much smaller event. Um, you know, everybody that was there was like, holy cow, this can happen over here on the East Coast. That's crazy. Yeah, I've talked to Russell from Buggy Whip probably about eight times in the last 24 hours, give or take, and uh, he keeps... Boyfriend. You know, oh, yeah. No, he, he reverts back and talks about TakeOver and how thankful he is to be involved in that show. You know, I, he's, and he's such a good dude, too, that it just is such a natural fit. I mean, he's one. I, I've been calling him for the last couple of years, one of the busiest guys in off-road, and it's so cool to go out to an event and see him actually get to get behind the wheel of his car, so... I think that's that's the sentiment a lot of a lot of brands are having and, and brand owners are having um, in the in the event space and and I think people are just getting burnt out on the you know just going somewhere setting up a tent you know for a thousand bucks and then walking away at the end of the day with nothing to show for it or or even to speak about yeah 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 I mean it's been two months since we've done the show we already covered Oklahoma and stuff but how was Oklahoma for you or how how was Utah for you I mean we had a great time last year this year was nuts. So that. last year, I tagged along with you because I wasn't even part of TakeOver mm -hmm. at that point and uh, just kind of hung out with you guys and walked the event and checked it out and checked out the scenery because, I mean, it was a first-year event for everybody. No one had been there yet. Um, and so it was pretty awesome. And, and going back, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, I want to go out and shoot stuff on these rocks and these mountains and these ravines and these valleys on the sand and 
And in reality, I was, I was stuck covering the event because that's what my job was, right? So, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of um, opportunities I wanted to get out and do. And I got to go out for a little bit with Brandon from HDR and um, Kurt from Slick Rock. And uh, we went up with their new Ranger with on 42s or whatever that is. Nuts. Um, that thing's pretty crazy. And we had a little bit of a breakdown on Double Sammy. And, and it was pretty cool to see, um, you know, Kurt jump in you know, like Superman, like I got this move. <laughs> he had the tools, he had the knowledge, which was even, you know, more impressive to see in action. Um, it's one thing to see somebody online say that they're a, a professional in a certain area. And it's a different thing to see them in action and apply that knowledge on, you know, in a quick fashion. And that's so, that's why I'm so thankful for takeover because we know these dudes, we rub elbows with these dudes, but it's always remotely and it's always through media. Takeover gives us the opportunity to ru- literally shake hands and uh, collaborate, talk. And I mean, those slick rock collaborate guys and listen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those slick rock guys are some of the nicest guys we run across in the, in the entire sphere. And shout out to to those guys. Um, you know, I think you and I have talked at some point about them not being super uh, present on social media over the last, I don't know, six months or whatever. But talking to Kurt about it, you know, they, they really took a step back to kind of just re rejuvenate and, and take a step back from everything because they had been pushing so hard for so long that, you know, taking a break with the family and just, you know, going out and boating and, and vacationing and, and spending some time off from the business. They own, you know, a huge Ford dealership and a bunch of other stuff. Wow. So, you know, grinding every single day at work behind the desk and then coming and doing Slick Rock all day long, you know, I'm sure that would just grind away everybody's gears after a while. Well, in my opinion, you know, I've talked about... You, you know, there's there's no shortage of people in the off-road sphere that want to do kind of what we're doing right now. And when people hit me up and ask me for what the first step is, I said, well, first thing you have to have is you have to have a Zach. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the production element, I think you're turning stuff out or have the ability to turn stuff out. <laughs> I was going to prob- say, I have the ability. Sure, too. <laughs> sure. But you have the ability to turn stuff out the better part of in 25% of the time that it would take a normal a normal human being to do this. And anybody that does want to do this really quickly finds out that this is a full-time gig. It's yeah, a job. if you really want to put out a, you know, a decent quality product with you know, some decent effort and, and thought process that goes into it, it's not a quick thing, and it's not a quick thing to learn either. Right. So uh, you, know, you, you figure you see a lot of these um, YouTubers and, and whatever online doing stuff and bank coverages and going to you know, conferences or going to do whatever – uh, a lot of those guys that make that happen usually have like a team of editors and and stuff like that that do stuff for them. They're just out filming. Yeah, and uh, so it does take a lot of effort to to kind of wrangle all the elements and produce it all together. Yeah, and you know when we were on site there in Utah, we we were hanging out with Wilkie all week, and Wilkie has people that he brings to those events to help him do that very thing. And I've been approached to kind of try and do something similar for full throttle battery to kind of share that experience to tell those stories and to do it via video and i've told them i'm going there's no way i can do this myself i mean no. you're gonna have to uh, the the kid that works with blake his name's will i'm like you're gonna have to get me a will because yeah. there's there's no way there, i mean it, it, i have a full-time job right and this one's gonna put it right through the roof and as, as passionate as i am about doing some of those things and telling some of those stories and there's a lot of value to doing it it's just i don't have the time i don't have the talent that some of those kids have i mean like will will's amazing you know, what you're doing is amazing. You know, Cameron, our buddy from the Idaho BDR, but, uh, you know, there's a serious cost associated with that and a, a very serious time investment. There's definitely, you know, the element of, of what you put out. If you do it yourself, it's always going to be handheld at yourself, you know, from arm's length. It's right. always going to be that thing. Whereas if you have a team, then you can get real creative. You can do some pretty awesome stuff. So. For sure. And it, and it never hurts to have a couple extra set of eyes out there to help you tell a story because those guys, that's what they do for a living. Yeah. You know? Well, and just even to tell you that you did that wrong or you're not good enough or whatever right. and, and be, in, a, in a constructive way, not a, not a put you down way. So, right. but I think, I think the content creation element of events is something our industry has lacked primarily. And the only ones that were ever doing it were the guys that had big budgets and big crews and, you know, title sponsors and stuff like that uh you know an event like takeover really opens it up to you being whoever you are to come out and do it so though at at uh utb takeover utah there was a um a young couple uh that had sold everything bought an rv and they're they're just doing vlogs on youtube and they came down 
and volunteered for the event. They participated with, you know, running the the activities and everything like that. But, you know, they were basically just creating content for their channel and, and doing stuff. And they were doing a great job doing it because they did it. They were awesome workers. They did some good work ethic, good attitudes. They worked long days and uh, they did a good job. And it, for them, you know, it was an experience. It was content. It was all that stuff for them. And, and the same thing can happen for any brand. If you're out there, if you're, you know, one of the smaller whip companies or if you're, a, um, you know, a parts manufacturer that's just starting out or whatever, you can go one, to one of these events and really knock out some awesome content with some awesome people and, and do some awesome networking as well while you're out doing it. Right. All right. So, but so Utah, you know, we kind of, kind of scratched the surface on it, but what, uh, what was your name? A couple of your top takeaways from that event. Like what, what were some of the things that you really kind of use to put a little fuel in the fire that really, you know, you know, the perfectly struck golf ball is always the golf ball that keeps you coming back to doing playing golf very similar in uh, UTV so like what uh, what was the what were some of the moments on that event that really kind of fueled you up and made you got you stoked I think that there's some easy ones to call out you know the big ones like Huckfest and all that stuff are are easy answers um, but I think more so is the the audience participation and, and reactions to some of these things so like when they go to the sand drags and the unlimited cars are are crazy fast and you know putting on a big show going down for the podium you know there was one race the end the last couple of guys racing um were two yxes one of them had a wheelie bar on it um the other one was a uh, jet packard always a fast car right uh and like the, the fastest <laughs> <laughs> and and the green car with a wheelie bar you know on the last race um because it's a best of three at that point or I guess they did a double elimination. The, the racers all voted for double elimination or whatever. So the the green car had won. And so they went into a, a theoretical third race where um, last man standing at that point. And that green car got all wonky and didn't realize that he had his wheels started off at like one, one o'clock. And so when he let on, let on to the gas, he just went straight towards the, the tree and then had to let off to correct and then still took jed which wow. is like that's no, insane me as the camera guy had my camera on jed because it was expected that jed would win mm -hmm. like you just you would call that as what it is they win and then the guy that went crazy and then corrected and then got back into it still overtook him which was wow. like a total underdog story and i think that's the kind of stuff that people are really like excited to talk about and, and see and, and experience and so um i think the uh the rally fest, the rally course up on the hillside behind Bender Row, I think that has a huge potential to grow. Shout out to Blake on that one, man. Dude, he he, he took that mobs that freaking stuff. It was so killer. I think it was like a, a minute forty two or something like that. Yeah. No, it was crazy. And and what even crazier is that uh, was it? Yeah, it was it was um, BJ from mm -hmm. Addiction was Nuts. four tenths behind him. Yeah. Like it was that close. And and I, I told Blake this when I went and took a picture for the victory picture was Blake was so like dialed. He was in tune with that course, even though he had only pre run it once, right? He was in tune with that course and his car knew exactly how to drive it and knew exactly where to point it and when to throttle into it and was very strategic and he got the fastest time. And then BJ comes out with the, the green machine, which, you know, is notoriously tough and it's abused. Been it's been around the block a few times and just lays in the gas and never lefts off, right? He's just, I got photos of him on the rocks on the backside, just wop, drop, wop, drop. Nuts. And, you know, he got second place, four tenths behind the leader. On a short course setup. On, a, on, on his suspension. His suspension set up for short course and, and he did that well. Yeah. Yeah. It's not set up for rocks. <laughs> no, definitely not set up for rocks. And... And the crazy thing is that, well, I mean, he has bigger, bigger tires and everything on it, but um, it's just really cool to see that story of a very skilled racer that is known to have to play it the whole way through instead of just, you know, letting go of the car dies, whatever, versus a guy that is like, this, this car can take whatever I throw at it, so I'm just going to throw it all the way to the wall. Yeah. And it's two strategies that ended up being identical at the end, but it's just cool to see that story play out whereas you see everybody else doing whatever they're doing um it's a testament to parts it's a testament to knowledge it's a testament to 
you know, practice and, and experience and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and you got to, Blake, the way that he tunes his cars, the way that he wrenches on his cars, I got to have, I got to believe that he has a very firm grasp on what that thing can put up with. For sure. And I mean, that knowledge is going into his TT bug, right? I yeah. mean, like, it's pretty crazy. Well, he and I, uh, we went out on an industry ride. I want to say it was like Thursday or Friday night. We were going to go do a, um, a night shoot for buggy whip. Um, get all the cars all lined up and take photo photographs, take video. And we headed out and it's a very veritable who's who of industry people and some fast guys. I'm in last place because I don't know where we're going. So I'm just following the group, right? And Blake takes off like a bat out of hell. <laughs> Within about 200 to 300 yards, I'm right on him. Like I, I was just like, okay, so we're hauling the mail. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. And I flog the car and get like right on him. And Sand Hollow is a mixture of sand trails. If you've never been there, it's a mixture of sand trails and rock trails. And and it, when I go through a rock trail, I show that stuff so much respect because my wallet isn't as fat <laughs> as most people would think, and I don't have I don't have budget or anything like that to fix a lot of broken stuff. You were on the X3. On I that. was on the X3, and we get into those trails, and those rocks start popping up, and he's going through that stuff four to five times faster than I'm willing to go. You know, because I'll, I'll, I'll destroy my car. And he's flying through that. And then we get back in the sand and just, zoop, I'm right back <laughs> up on him. But he, he blew a belt, you know, about maybe 10 minutes into that trip back, he blew a belt and we had to pull over. We all got out of the cars, pull off all our safety gear, pull off all the helmets, this, that, and the other. And two to three minutes later, the group joins us. Like we were on it, like freaking flying. And it's so fun to ride with a guy like that. You know, coming from motocross, I used to ride with professional supercross riders. And there's no way I could keep up with those guys. But then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, like in the trails and stuff, I was able to keep up with those guys. And it's, it's really nice to ride with people that can give you an idea where you're at. And that was one of the funnest event, funnest freaking runs I've done in a long time. But Yeah, was, there's a lot of really awesome trails back there. And the cool thing amazing. about Utah is that everybody can go do whatever they're comfortable with. Like if you're crazy and want to send it, you can go do it. If you want to do sand only, you can do it. And there's some crazy sand climbs if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and then there's some ledges if you want to do some crazy jumping. Yeah. There's some um, awesome rocks and there's some awesome scenery. There's just a little bit of everything for everybody. Oh, yeah. I uh, So one thing we haven't covered is the X3 got a little work done. And it's got a significant amount more power than it used to have. And so I go on a couple of shoots, and what you're talking about is some of those crazy sand climbs. I was out there with, with industry folks, and we're setting up a shoot. And some of those sand climbs that I was seeing, I'm like, you know, I'm just running my 10s or DSRs out there. And I think I was running 11 in the front, uh, actually maybe like 8 in the front, 11 in the back, somewhere in there. And I was attacking some of the gnarliest sand ledges that had no tire tracks on them whatsoever and nobody was following me absolutely nobody was following me and that we, could have been a <laughs> a sign of stupidity oh yeah. or, or respect well uh they they shot it you know every time they saw me go after one of those gnarly freaking sections they they would pull in with that with that camera car and they would shoot it so hopefully it turns out pretty cool but shout out to that honda that thing went everywhere and did everything I know, right yeah that thing's cool but like we went out uh we went out to do a shoot with six to seven cars in tow, and I was guiding them. And I had a, a kid behind me in, in a little RS1, a little short course racer. You know, she's a, she's a pro. She's a stud, too. And uh, we pull in, and the, the producer the producer's giving me kind of instructions on what he's after. And I, I yell at her. I'm like, Maddie, they want us, like, really close. And her dad was there. He goes, oh, she's all over you. Like, she's, she's all over your back. I'm like... I'm sending it for the gram. Like I'm drifting the entire time. Like the whole caravan is just holding a line and they're pinned. I'm not. I'm literally at 45 degrees drifting, flipping it back down the dune drift and back up the dune drift. I'm like, if you want me to go to a straight line, this car will disappear. <laughs> it's like, it, 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 I was so happy with how that car is performing. It is, it is quick. So yeah. you said you were on tensors. You recently just put those on yeah. and don't have a lot of seat time with them. What was your thought process? What was your experience with those? So uh, which one specific, specifically, or do you have? I've got the DSRs, uh, thirty-three inch DSRs, and I knew that in the sand that they were going to spin, and I knew that they weren't the most ideal rock trail, rock tire. Um, some people came, had come up to me and said that they'd seen a sponsored tensor guy running. Uh, running DSRs and kind of struggled in the rocks out of Sand Hollow the week before. 
those tensors annihilated that place. I loved them. Like it, it they, I couldn't have asked for them to be, to do anything better. Like the sidewalls were amazing on some of the stuff that we were doing in the rocks In the rocks. I had no issue whatsoever. And I was going after every gnarly feature that anybody that, I mean, they were using me as a lab rat on some of those shoots. You know, the guy that, that we were out there with a guide from San Hollow, and he was kind of guiding me on the lines, this, that, and the other. And as soon as I would get lined up for the line, I'd attack it, and the car would handle it really, really well. And then I'm almost unshootable at that point because once I know the car has it, I'm going to go three times as fast through that <laughs> obstacle for the second shoot. <laughs> and those tensors were amazing. They were amazing. Like we went up one feature where a guy was telling me that he's never seen, he's only seen maybe one or two two seaters make it up. And I didn't even pull a tire, you know, and the, and the tires bit, we went right up it, but in the sand, in the sand, they hold a line really well. They love ruts. Like you can dive that thing into a rut as hard as you want. Sidewall, take it, you know, they'll hook in. It's very moto like, but in the actual deep sand on the dunes, oh man, you get as much slide as you want with power, and it's <laughs> right. so fun. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'm ever going to switch tires. I love them. I absolutely love those DSRs. They're amazing. Now, when we went on the BDR in Idaho, uh, uh, Coop, Coop had was running them. DSRs too, right? Yeah. But he had like 35s or something. Yeah, 35s. Yeah. Yeah, which is what I should have done, but we'll get, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> I might so, put 35s on the Pro. You, you, you're going to need some training work. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. So just to summarize the takeover season, I think all the events were great. Um, I think they all had, you know, pros and cons if you wanted to kind of really get to the nitty gritty of everything. But, um, you know, they, they're all unique. And I think that's what makes takeover unique is that these events are in awesome destination locations and, and put you with people and community that you wouldn't have otherwise and to do awesome things. So if you were to go back out there just to recreate, go out, what kind of car would you want? Um, are we talking Utah or just all of it? Hollow. Um, you know, I, I couldn't argue against a four-seater Razor. Um, I think the Can-Am Commander um, X, XTR, whatever that thing mm-hmm. is called, I think it would be awesome, um, especially because you're not really having to go fast per se, um, and you can loosen the suspension up, disconnect the sway bars, and you'll have a killer time. Um, then you got the storage bed for all your cooler and everything else, so it's, it's a great option. Uh, the, the general would be awesome build. People have done it though, so it's kind of boring. The Ranger though that I rode with Brandon from ACR in with those huge forty twos on it or whatever they are, I was completely blown away by how smooth that thing rolled through Sand Hollow. Like, yeah, we were going through some sand, but then we hit rocks and we hit chop and then we hit ruts, and you know, it was like that thing just rolled right over the top of everything and had no problems whatsoever. And I think that was a cool. It's obviously not fast. It's not what it's meant for. It's on, it's on high lifter six inch dual idle or portals and and all that stuff. So that's no joke. Yeah, it's a serious machine. Um, and of course, HDR high quality suspension and all that stuff. But did you see uh, some KRXs running out there? Oh, I saw a ton of KRXs out there just destroying everything. Destroying straight in up. In a good way. Straight up destroying everything. Yeah. Like, I was blown away. Like, they they're, they were leading tours out. There were just nothing but KRXs, and nothing slowed them down. Well, they if you go amazing. down to the, the UTV rental shop just down the road on the on the lake there, I mean, that's basically all they have is just a whole fleet of KRXs because anyone can get in the back, in the driver's seat and go have a great time in San Hollow and not have to worry about the car. And they're all stock. Yeah, stock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I and some of them are even running desert tires. You'd see some KM3, BF Goodrich or something like that, and they're out there just Yeah, as they, as they, you know, as customers slice tires and, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. they, they'll just buy or they'll just put on whatever they have laying around or whatever. But uh, anyways, I think any car, of any modern car would have a great time. I saw like OG Rhinos out there having a good time. I saw old school like Mavericks and Wildcats and... Everybody out there having a good time. I didn't see anybody not having a good time out there. The Buggy Whip and Pro Eagle four seater Talons went out quite a bit too and did really well as well. You know, uh, you know, I went out with Russell. He was on the Talon, and uh, Taylor from Amped Off Road drove that Talon a little bit as well. And we went through some pretty gnarly rocks, and uh, the Talon did a good job. You know, it's it's definitely long. It uh, it didn't have the flexibility of Blake's Pro or my my two seater, but it uh, did really well. I was really impressed. Yeah, it seems like a pretty stable platform, and the and the clutching and everything with it um, definitely makes it awesome for a camera. And having four low and an automatic and a manual <laughs> transmission that something Yamaha should have done right from the get go. Yeah, no kidding. And speaking of Yamaha, everybody's it 
biting at the bit for Yamaha to come out with something. And do you think that's going to happen? I don't think they're going to come out with anything. I think I think there would have been rumors already. You know, I, I, we've been talking about the need for the YXZ to get a total revamp, and I don't even know if it's on their radar. I did hear a rumor that they're done making sport quads. That's nuts. Because well, I think the that best. market has been replaced by UTVs. It is, but they were the ones that they were the pinnacle company doing it. You know. It, uh, well, I mean, you have, yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the Raptors and everything else that they were putting out, the the crazy thing is that, you know, Polaris got back into it recently with their, their S model, um, Scrambler and all that stuff. So, and that's a, that's a long travel quad, which is really interesting too. Um, but, but yeah, I think that market shrank a lot when the, like the Aces came out and then the, the 800, 900 S's and 1000 S. Um, so yeah, I, I just foresee people being more in tune with getting in something with a cage and a harness than sitting on top of something that's going to throw you and sure. roll on top of you. So, sure. um, so just to wrap that up, we've talked for a half an hour about takeover, uh, like we have the last four or five episodes. Um, great, great show. Uh, awesome to everybody that came out and said, hi, took pictures of me and, and all that kind of stuff. I know people stopped by your booth and were saying hi and, and all that stuff. I had a lot of good times recording podcasts with people in interesting places. I haven't listened to the Dune and Destroy <laughs> one. How was that one? Well, you're, you're talking into a microphone that has a 50% chance of being the one that was held by Kyle in the hot tub. So. Oh, then I'm start licking it. <laughs> What's up, Kyle? <laughs> hey, big guy. So, no, it, I, I think San Hollow, the two podcasts we did from San Hollow was, was kind of refreshing for me to just, it doesn't have to be, you know, super high production. It can just be fun. And, you know, yeah. we did it in Brent's, in Brent's uh, Orange Crush car. And then we did one in the hot tub with Dune and Destroy. And, and I think it was just, you know, putting ourselves in that awkward position and making things tense for and, sure. and all that stuff was a lot of fun. Yeah. Kyle and I have been texting each other a little bit today and uh, I won't show you those texts because it is of a very <laughs> inappropriate nature at times. <laughs> so, yeah. Those, aren't those guys a blast though, man? Yeah. They're, they're so, cool. They're so much fun. Yeah. And, and the they they get kind of a rap online for being the rowdy boys and, and just going crazy all the time, but they're actually um, pretty down to earth guys and, and 100%. like to have, chill and have a good conversation and all that. So they actually were in the house right next to us in San Hollow. Nice. Uh, and so it was pretty easy to connect with them once I once we figured that out and all that. And uh, shout out to Adrian from PRP uh, or from um, Rancher Racing, um, and you know, sitting between those two boys in the hot tub. <laughs> that yeah. was an experience for him. Yeah, and uh, we, we also got to meet a couple of the other channels. Uh, Reckless Ranch out of Oregon was there. He's uh, He and his buddy have run a couple of YXEs. Cool, cool dudes. They're going to be out at uh, Goons in the Dunes, so that's going to be a good time. And then uh, the UTV guys. You know, well, UTV guys were on site at Coos Bay. I didn't get a chance to talk to them or anything like that, but uh, they came up at uh, Utah and finally got to rub elbows with those dudes then they're hella nice you know it's really good to see people out there having fun with this and kind of creating creating stories yeah there was a lot of a lot of groups out there deranged off road and um just a ton of other guys out there and and uh so i'm really bad with names in the first place everybody knows this now <laughs> I, I just can't remember people's names uh and i have met probably a good two three hundred people that i i know online that in the real world, you're just like, oh, <laughs> no, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I have people come up to me at that event all the time, uh, say what's up, talk to me like they haven't seen me in a couple of months. We're carrying on like normal, and as soon as we leave, my coworkers like, oh, you know those guys? I'm like, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, and that sounds so rude, and I feel terrible about it. I really do. And but no disrespect to anybody no, listening that not may at have all. felt not, like we were ignoring them or anything. No, but. not at all. I, I just, you, you, you go to those events, and you shake so many hands, you meet so many people that, uh, you know, if it weren't for Facebook, honestly, when I start seeing stuff on Facebook, and I'll see a name interact with something that I put up there, and I'll, and I'll pull it up. And I'll see who it is. I'm like, oh, man, I talked to that guy in Utah. Fantastic. That's who this guy is. And I started to feel a little bit better about it. But at, in real time when it happens, I just kind of carry on the conversation. Um, I'm very interested in what people are doing. Uh, I'm just super excited to be there, super excited that they're having a good time and stuff. But, I mean, you're right, man, in terms of the amount of people that we meet. And uh, remembering all those names, it's, de it's definitely <laughs> has its challenges, no question about it. And it's, it's especially hard when you got, things going on that you're supposed to be responsible for like you know with with everything that i was responsible for with takeover um you know you're always in a hurry you're always behind you're always buried right and you know with with having a booth there you know you have some guys to help support the booth and everything but you're still buried yeah and um you know it, it's hard to just 
have a clear sense of focus on everybody unless you can sit down with them and just talk with them, which I find to be the most entertaining part of all of it is, is being able to just hang out with somebody that you've known online but never actually physically at, been able to interact with and seen them at a show and chilling over a drink and and you know maybe having a couple of noodles or something with with them from vendor row it's, it's always a good time for sure no question about it yeah i would say uh utah was a success huge success had a lot of fun and i kind of it was a bummer when I took off. No doubt, I was I was missing it right away. Cause like Coos Bay, when I leave Coos Bay, it's like I can't wait to get home. You know, it's such an amazing event, but it wears you out. No question about it. You get well. The so thing about Coos though is you're also like I'll be back. Like, yeah, I'll be back in oh, a no, few no, months four, or whatever. Four, well, in, in Utah, hours. it's like okay, yeah. I only I have to schedule this into my yeah. year. Well, in 48 hours later after Coos Bay, I'm, I'm missing it already. But that event is so busy that you're just like, you know, yeah, good. It's good to be on the road. It's good to be get back home. So among all the things that we're uh, looking at doing, we have, uh, you know, a lot of catch up to do at the end of the year. We have our holiday episodes coming up here shortly. Uh, so we got to get ready for that. So if you're a business uh, a entrepreneur, anybody that sells a product or a service that relates to the UTV industry, uh, hit me up at info at sidebysideguys.com. Elevator speech. And uh, we'll try to get you guys included on any of the Black Friday holiday specials you got coming. Uh, every year we put together a whole page with all the links and all the discounts and all that stuff for everybody to kind of go shopping off of. And it saves you a lot of time from having to go scour you know, Facebook or sign up for newsletters or, or whatever. And I'm not saying those are bad things, but um, you know... Back in the old days when you used to get the Sunday paper before Thanksgiving, that was always the thing that I did. We would scour through the deals, figure out what we we're going to go get and go after and all that. That was the fun part of Black Friday before Black Friday got stupid. Um, and so I want to bring some of that kind of enthusiasm uh, to the UTV industry. And, and I think it's been well received the last couple of years we've done it. Yeah. If you're looking to buy me anything, start and stop with uh, Dixon Flannels. Thank you. <laughs> um he is he is partial to those um, and the weird the weird more weird color the better so oh yeah without a doubt um, I want that Crenshaw one let's get all NWA up in here <laughs> they did I did see a cool one that was like a lime green that just came out it was black with a lime green stripe that looked pretty hot so oh yeah 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 that would look pretty sweet yeah the shreddy ones look really good yeah that turquoise and pink is is pretty hot you mean the one that I have yeah yeah which means I can't buy it now so yeah. ask me what I paid for it. <laughs> So, um, anyways, we got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, and speaking of things coming up, we are two days before a small thing happening in the industry. Oh man, how far into this show we are? We're, we're in thirty-five <laughs> minutes, and let's let let's just gloat. <laughs> let's just bask. Let's gloat. It's what's happening, Zach. We're uh, Tuesday. We're recording this Sunday before the big Polaris Razor launch on uh, November 9th uh, at, I think they're doing a live stream at 1 p.m. Central Time. So 11 o'clock our time over here on the West Coast. We'll be watching the live streams from Polaris Razor to see what the new the new family of Razors, as they call it, is uh, going to look like. They're about to announce the uh, RZR Pro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You mean the the Pro X, X XP? Is that is that the new one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're all looking forward to uh, to seeing that come out. Uh, they've been teasing the two uh, the two units in a silhouette. Uh, shout out to uh, some of the photographers I know that took those shots. Um, they did a good job, and uh, obviously strategically hiding stuff so you can't see exactly all what's coming. But we've seen a lot of information come from their teasers when they I was thoroughly surprised that they dropped the two liter announcement as a teaser. What, what was your thought on that? That I was right. <laughs> so, so they came out with the first teaser saying, you know, Razor's coming on this date. And then they came out with a second teaser that said, uh, with engine options up to two liters, um, which obviously confirms everything we've been saying for the last two and a half years. Um, but that being said, I find it interesting that they say up to two liters. Do you think that they're going to stick with uh, the current thousand cc scenario, like genre of motors, and then the two liter, or do you think there's maybe something in the middle? I don't think there's going to be anything in the middle. I think we would have caught wind on it by now, but I think it's going to, it's going to be a thousand cc. It's going to be a liter jump, and it sounds like they're put. Uh, I've I haven't heard anything to the contrary, but it sounds like they're going to do something. Uh, they're going to, maybe it's like a slingshot motor or something. What's a slingshot? I don't know. Isn't it like a, a three-wheeled thing for retired people? I mean, I'd retire in one. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But no, it's uh, 
So the four cylinder. Uh, do, you, do you even Harley Davidson, bro? No, I would Indian. Flares <laughs> to the core, bro. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, uh, I don't know. I there's always been, or I shouldn't say always. There's been rumors of a triple sitting in the wings for Polaris. Um, if you look at the landscape of their competition, aka Can Am, right in the in the in the sport class UTVs, um, really their biggest competition has been the fact that they've been limited to this two liter or this uh, two cylinder, and this two cylinder has been played out. It doesn't have any block thickness to really go up in size or a liter or you know bigger compression unless you're willing to go into the full aftermarket rebuild of the motor uh the can has got so much overhead or, or potential overhead that you can push that thing to the limits you know sky high the can could come out right now with an ecu tune for that for that motor that would be 250 300 horsepower like with stock components say it again yeah mm. so so the thing about the polaris motor the the pro star two cylinder you know motor that we've all seen is that there's just really no room to grow in them you can't push them very hard without replacing half the motor so the two liter is huge in that they're able to you know jump up into the bigger horsepower segment um in the bigger displacement segment but they're really i've talked to the guys that have had their hands inside that motor that have tore down that motor checked the parts checked the the you know the specs of that motor and they're all basically saying this motor is the same thing as the two cylinder just doubled up. And so even common parts inside, things like that, that have all just been doubled up. So if that's the case and the block hasn't been re-engineered, then that four cylinder doesn't really have a lot of room to grow. Are you more excited about the motor or are you more excited about the components? Because I am 100% excited about the chassis upgrades. Chrome Molly? It's gonna be tough, man. I don't think they will. I, I, That's, I've heard that. I mean, verbatim. I mean like, that that I, like I've heard that from the, a concern level from the aftermarket. They're just like, yeah, we don't know where we line up on this car in the aftermarket based on how tough it already is coming from Polaris. Well, my thought is, is people want to make their car blingy. You know, HCR is still gonna sell long travel kits. You know. For right. sure, regardless if that if the A arms are all chrome molly on the Pro R, right. HCR is still going to do really well on that car for sure. Well, if you look at the components that have been shown, and when you look at the components that I have pictures of that people have sent me, and, and all this other stuff, um, the manufacturing process related to building those and the way that they're engineered, um, to me, doesn't say that they've been upgraded. It just says that it's a new shape, it's a new size, it's a new length, right. it's a new whatever. Right. Now they did tease in one of their teasers that they have re. Um, structured the whole front end, whether that hap- follows all the way through the car and it's not just the front end, uh, that's what we're going to be waiting to see. Right. But uh, what what's interesting is they've put a new trailing toe link on the real tr- the rear trailing arm, uh, which pivots at the same point as a trailing arm and then crosses through to the knuckle and then attaches there. Yeah. And to do that, now you're putting a whole lot more stress in that corner of the chassis so that that corner of the chassis is going to have to be upgraded uh, quite a bit to just keep everything steady, uh, make, make it sure that the tabs aren't breaking off. So, um, And then the other part was that they, they have a new shock system coming out. Uh, so for the ultimate trim level, they're going to have these new Fox uh, Dynamics DV. Um, 3.0, 3.0, 3.5? Um, no, I think they're going to be 2.5, 3.0, yeah. like, like the other generation it was. But uh, the interesting thing is that they're going to be you know dual valve control, so they're going to have rebound and compression controlled by the ECU. And in the actual interface, I looked at the actual manual. I found uh, a manual that had that shock in- system in it. And in there, it shows that the actual interface will show you both compression and rebound settings. Um, and there's going to be di- four different modes, you might call them. Um, they're going to be like a desert mode and a Baja mode and a, you know, a trail mode and a, and all that. So those will give you your different variances between compression and rebound. And then your stiff and soft settings will give you the, the plush or firm version of that setting on the ECU. So they're catching up a little bit to Can-Am on the shock side because Can-Am's had rebound and compression and their new smart shocks does do both of those controls uh but the can-ams ecu does it a lot slower 
So their sample rate on the electronics is a lot, on the sensors is a lot slower and their updates to the valving is a lot slower. And that's why you'll see the guys like Shock Therapy say that, you know, there's still lots of room for upgrading these things because there's still a lot of issues with them. And not issues in a bad way, just things to fix and make better, right? And and so the Polaris one's really interesting because they may, I mean, they may nail it out of the out of the gate with with these new shock upgrades, which is which, as you know, now having sh- upgraded your shocks and having them tuned, is night and day difference on how different, a car rides. It's a different car, completely different car. Yeah. So I think between you know all the chassis improvements that we're going to see, uh, the engine part of it doesn't get me as excited as those things because just like on the Can Am's the 22s uh, that just came out. When they fixed the tow link, when they fixed the chassis uh, thickness, um, they fixed a whole lot of the issues that people were having. Uh, that to me shows me that they're moving forward. They're not staying still. They're not just you know reaping the money out of everybody's pockets. Right. No, I'm excited to see see it get hands on it, get behind the wheel of it. I can tell you right now that there is a gentleman that you've had on the podcast within the last couple months that's going to receive his before hammers. Um, I am trying to put together a trip to Glamis leading into Hammers. So I would go right from Glamis to Hammers. And uh, I was going to meet with this guy and a handful of other industry folks and go out for a rip. And he may very well have that car. He told me he'll have that car and have it built by then, which that is the end of January. So that's coming up really fast. With the absence of Polaris having a strong industry footprint at the races the last year and a half, two years with Can-Am kind of just crushing them in the race segment, I think that they're going to come out hard and all their races are going to be running on the new cars. So that being said, we've talked about the Pro-R coming out and being teased and that chassis improvement. But what's more interesting is that, to, to me, is that that chassis is also being implemented into the Turbo S replacement. So if you look at the teaser image, there's a left and there's a right. And the left is the Turbo R and on the right is the Turbo S replacement. And it's in the Pro XP chassis. And it has all the Pro R features. It has the trailing arm upgrades. It has all, all those things. 72 inch. So it's a wide, it's a long travel setup, just like the Turbo S was. It has the, the Pro R upgrades. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how they differentiate the two. Like what's the actual difference between them besides the motor. Uh, and if there's a huge price difference between them. So I put out a, a post the other day about, you know, let's, yeah. let's, let's play the guessing game on the pricing, right? Um, and, and so when we look at the pricing of the razors, uh, they just went through a price increase this month. Like all the, all the retail right rates went up variable depending on model. They kind of cleaned up the curve, you might say, um, on that. And another rumor that was flying around was that they may have also changed the dealer margins on what the dealer can pull out of that sale. So even though there's a price increase, the dealer might not have that flexibility to work with you as much um, on that, so uh, don't beat them up too too hard. But um, but the 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 prices did go up a little bit, and we have the new car coming out. Um, where do you think the price falls for the the Turbo S replacement and the Turbo R or the the Pro R? Um, do you think they're going to be extreme, or do you think they're going to be kind of reasonable to that kind of price adjustment of the Pro the Turbo S price, and then just a little bit above it? The uh, loaded out Turbo S was retailing anywhere from 28 to 32, depending on two seat, four seat on the Dynamics car. I think that your base model Turbo S two seater is probably going to be in that 32 range with the, uh, you know, 32.5, maybe 33 with the four seater probably going up to about 35. The actual Pro R with the the four banger and uh, just that thing loaded out to the guild. I wouldn't be surprised if it retails out at high 38s, maybe 39 with dealerships possibly moving at about 42 to 4. I've even heard 45. You've got dealerships right now. They won't even let you put a deposit on a car. They won't even let you buy a car unless you agree to buy $2,000 worth of accessories and then have the dealership install them. That's how... I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that if you're a dealer that is doing, I've heard non-refundable deposits, I've heard guaranteed accessory buys, I've heard guaranteed warranty buys, uh, and a whole slew of other different weird tactics to get money from you, um, from the dealers. Yep. If you are in an area where you have a dealer that's doing that to you... uh, my personal belief is that you should not be supporting that dealer. A 100%. dealer should be 100% upfront, should be honest. Everything should be clear and transactionable. I don't think there should be any kind of liability on your end to lose money on a product that's not even out yet. So 
especially when we're talking about inventory availability and, and things like that. If a, if a dealership's going to push you into that corner, that sales guy either needs to get fired or that dealership needs to lose your business. Yeah, a sales guy is a little different than an actual a standard operating procedure from a dealership. And if a dealership is pulling those type type of games, I'm telling you right now, that's that's scumbag type tactics right there. I'm, I, I've got a problem with that. Yeah, I, I, I completely 100% understand a dealership's need to get the upsales to generate revenue for the business and keep the business running. I 100% understand that. But that should be a discussion between you and that sales guy uh, with no uh, contingency on whether or not you're buying a specific car at a specific point in time. Uh, if you want a car, you should be able to put a down payment on it and get that car. You shouldn't have to be pressured into an abusive relationship with your dealer. Totally agree. You know, unfortunately, until re machines are abundant, you're probably going to hear more and more stories just like this. You know, fortunately, up here in the neck of the woods that we're at, uh, we've got some dealers that are fairly straightforward, straight shooters. You know, I mean, they're, they're not going to cut deals just because they can't get cars. Why would they? But it's probably going to be a year or two until we get back to normal where, you know, there's no shortage of Kawasaki KRX is going for sixteen or $26,000, $28,000 now, when prior to COVID, you could get them for sixteen. Wasn't it crazy how when they came out six months later, we were talking about how they couldn't get rid of them fast enough. And then all of a sudden COVID hits and they become, you know, retail plus. Yeah. Yeah, so, no doubt. I'm looking forward to that ending. Yeah. I'm looking forward to just having options. Right. So yeah. anyways, uh, so Pro R coming out November 9th in a couple of days from now, uh, you know, we're speculating that the Pro S version will be coming out uh, as well. They may call it something completely different. Who knows, right? Um, so in relation to this information, I know we gloated very, very briefly there, but we have been talking about this car for two years. And, and everybody, you know, the doubters. Everybody's completely sick of hearing us talk about it. Well, I mean, they might, it might be sick, but I mean, the, the, it just turned into a troll fest. The uh, the pages where information got put up, it just turned into a troll fest, and it was kind of I'm not gonna say it was discouraging or anything like that. It's just kind of funny, you know, people people doubting an industry leader <laughs> like Polaris that they would do something like that. Oh no, it's not gonna be two liters. Oh no, you know, it's <laughs> I I it's never was coming. looking and, back at you know kind of the timeline of how things laid out when we posted stuff and and whatever, and uh, it it threw me back to that. Um, the meme that I posted with the uh, Tuttles from Orange oh, County throwing right. the chairs around. <laughs> and and it was like, you know, you want, the community wanted all these things that looked and acted like a Can-Am and then they got it and then everybody threw a fit about it because it looked like a Can-Am. Like, right. Uh, and now we're at a point where it's like, okay, we we all said we want a bigger, badder, harder, stronger, longer. Yeah. And now we're getting it and everyone's doubting it. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's no secret that the Pro-R was kind of the worst kept secret in off-road, you know, uh, I don't want to be a spoiler. I mean, there's two industry machines coming anywhere from the next six months to the next calendar year that I've got some detail on that are going. They're really exciting. Uh, I I want to maintain good standards with those those OEs <laughs> for sure. But uh, don't think that Can Am doesn't have an answer for this thing. Can Can Am's been on the record as saying we'll never be uh, horse powered. No, so. they uh, they have. I'll, I'll just say it. They have a monster coming. Yeah, you've yeah, been it, you've been saying that for a while. Oh well, it's been a while for sure. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> well. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know. While we're on the topic of what of, I don't, what I don't, real quick, what I don't know about their monster, I don't know if it's on an X3 chassis or it's a whole new car. I don't, I don't know that, but but it's much different than an X3. I can tell you that. And uh, let's just say that uh, I'm going to sit on my wallet for a little bit <laughs> and see what happens with the Pro R, what happens with Can Am, and what happens with Robbie before I make another decision. Yeah, I mean yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's things lot that could have so, <laughs> but but to that point, I was I was talking to some people or we we've known about the Pro R obviously, and we've known some people that have had it and we've known, you know, that, you know, Blake Blake Wilkie had mentioned a few times that, that he had been around it and I had edited, edited that out of the podcast and a few other spots just to keep him his butt covered and the reason I did that is because I knew he, they went and filmed with it. I knew that they had done this whole thing with RJ, but that was a year ago. Yeah. 
And people were like, no way, that was like this year. And I was like, no, that was like a year ago. And then there was a few different people that posted online on their social accounts saying, finally, we get to share this from last year. This is an, was an awesome time. We had a great time doing it. It just confirmed it was a year ago, which lines up with my original topics about the Pro-R being released last fall. And it didn't because, you know, of all the supply chain issues and all these other things that happened and the, un- the questionable nature around COVID and everything else. So uh, it kind of felt good <laughs> to get that finally out there and be like, yeah, I was right. Like, I wasn't crazy. Sure. And and the rumor is, is that this uh, this new Cam- Can-Am iteration, this new Can-Am platform was supposed to be out this fall, but they shelved, shelved it till next fall. Historically, Can-Am releases new models between June and July, June, somewhere between June and August. So... If this Pro R sets the world on fire, I would not be surprised whatsoever as Can Am really pushes a timeline forward on uh, t- their their version, their answer. I have no doubt that with the supply chain issues, because I mean, right now, as it stands at this moment, Can Am's telling dealers that you're not able to order or get vehicles until spring. And so if that's the case, then they're not able to keep up with a new car anyways. Yeah. So... I think that, you know, like I had talked before on a podcast about Polaris taking the opportunity to slow down, retool, get things in line for this big product launch, because this is not a small thing for them. This is a big iteration. This is a new this is a new 10 years for them. Um, you know, they got to do things right and take their time and, and the, the chips have to fall in the right place for them to, to actually start moving forward. So, um, you know, I, I think can definitely in the same boat where they're saying, well, we don't have to release this yet because we have X, Y, and Z to take care of first on the logistics side, as well as our competitors have delayed, as well as everything's still hot in the market, you yeah. know, things like that. Well, you and I haven't even had a chance to talk about 2022 yet, and I've got a ride that I'm trying to set up that we, you and I need to talk about. And with any luck, there's going to be three Pro R's on that trip. As well as maybe some other cars. Well, I'll be on another car, but... <laughs> I'll just be leading the way. Mm. But but I mean, there might be some, you know, may, there might be a speed car there or, or something like that. That would be pretty sick. Uh, you know, I'm st- uh, there. there's some rumors going around that, uh, I don't know, this could be really interesting, but I might be driving a Japanese car. We'll see. That'd be interesting. You know what? <laughs> I mean, it ain't going to go. It ain't going to go as fast as the Hyundai other cars, finally coming out with their UTV. Hyundai is uh, on board. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It is called the uh, the the Sonata SE. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see my my cool Mitsubishi SUV that I or uh, UTV that I had in Oklahoma? No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the uh, the, uh, the thing looked like a roller skate. Uh, to anybody listening, I took a playbook out of uh, Dustin Jones' uh, rental car playbook and uh, sent that thing to the moon in the dunes, and that was all-wheel drive, and that transmission pretty sure went back with one or two less gears in it. So, <laughs> Atta boy. <laughs> But uh, we had a time of our lives in that bad boy, so can't complain. Um, anyways, I'm excited to see the Pro-R finally come out and, and solidify the change in the industry, solidify the movement in legislation that's going to have to have happen around that car. Uh, I really am interested on seeing where Polaris has placed this vehicle in the legal ease of California and trails and off-road, you know, rules and regulations. So the thing that I'm most interested in is to see what score does with it because, uh, it is a two liter and, uh, well, I mean, the race series has already opened up an ultimate unlimited class thing where anybody can run anything as long as they're producing it. Well, I'm wondering if they're going to let this thing run in class 10 or if score is going to designate an entirely new class to a UTV two liter. You know, I think they'd be shooting themselves in the foot to let them cannibalize the class 10 in the truck market. Well, there's no shortage of class 10s out there that are at 800 horsepower, and it's going to take a lot of work to get that two liter Polaris to get it. Right. But what I'm saying is it's going to destroy that industry if they do that. So, you know, the off road industry is going to want to always hold on to race series and classes and all that stuff as long as they possibly can, because that's more money. That's more sponsorship. That's more racers. Uh, so if they just throw that thing into those truck classes and say it's a free for all, uh, I feel like that would be a bad choice just as it will cannibalize that industry and can bring it to a close. Well, we have some weird things happening in the industry. You've got uh, you've got UTVs running times out at Hammers, running times out at Baja that are very much very close to uh, the big class cars. You know, so I mean, you take the the the, the top five, top eight class tens. UTVs start to filter their way in there where they beat some of those guys between three to eight. And that's happened multiple times this year. Multiple times. That's happened at Hammers. That's happened in the desert. 
So I, I'm interested to see the impact of how this industry is going to change this week, um, you know, and over the next year, how the industry adapts to it. Um, another thing that I was thinking about was talking about the Can-Am car and, and all that, you know, Polaris coming out of the gate and saying, we're going to be the forerunner on the two liter or the over 1000 CC movement opens the door for everybody else to innovate, right? Like everybody probably has the motors already set. They already have bigger displacement motors, more cylinders, whatever. Uh, Always have jet skis that are over 1500 CCs. You know, they've got, right. they've got motors for sure. And, and snowmobile and jet ski 100%. technology all filter into the UTV market, which is really funny because a lot of people think this is all new stuff. This is actually a lot of old stuff that's being reinvented in a new chassis. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested to see how the industry says, what do we got in our playbook that we want to pull out now? Because they all got stuff waiting in the wings. They got stuff that R&D is taking care of over the last 10 years. Like, it'd be interesting to see how the industry adapts over the next two, one to two years. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see what the, the Turbo S replacement looks like because everybody's been wanting a new Turbo S, an updated Turbo S. Everyone loves the Turbo S, and they want to see a new platform that can bring that same satisfaction. From a pure sport machine to a mountain car to a uh, overland style machine, uh, the the or the OG Turbo S from when did they come out with that? 2017. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, 2016, 2017, yeah, somewhere so, in there. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, so late 17, so, I think. Yeah, yeah. So from like 2017 to 2021, uh, when they did away with it, uh, that's the best car that, I, that was in the industry. Well, I mean, you go look at some of the cars, like even at San Hollow when we were yeah. there, you know, talking with Kurt, his his favorite car is that Turbo S four seater that he has because that car can go anywhere, do anything at any time, no matter what. Yeah. And it's, it's a reliable goat for him. And being an X3 owner, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'm going to get hate for saying that, but it's it's very hard to dispute that. I mean, for the love of God, the freaking uh, the Turbo S, it does not matter what you want to do with it. You want to race with it, you want to overland with it, you want to dune with it, you want to trail ride with it. Everything's figured out. Every single thing is figured out. So you can build that thing into anything that you want. And it'll do it exceptionally well. And that's one reason why I'm excited about the new Pro S coming out because the chassis is better. It's more rigid. It's one piece. It's higher strength, better geometry, new trailing arms coming out, new front A arms technology coming out, all new stuff, all great stuff that the industry can now adopt, make better, improve on, build bigger, build stronger. I mean, I was talking to you about if I could get my hands on a, on a Pro R, the first thing I'd want to do is throw some HCR on it and and see just how tough we can make that car mm. <laughs> so um you might say i have a soft spot for some hdr suspension I'm, i might have to get some of that yeah I, i'm actually uh talking to them about maybe doing uh full hcr on the x3 so i'm stoked and which which i got a lot of cognito on there right now but you know and what's on the pro you got pros all hdr yeah yeah hdr and rcv a CR RCV, yep. uh, except up a front that something got mixed up where... Are you still running uh, Pro S or uh, Turbo S axles? Yeah, up front. <laughs> well, I mean, when, when HCR converts over a Pro to a long travel, they use uh, Turbo S hubs. Gotcha. So and that's uh, so let's talk real quick just to wrap up the episode and make it longer again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the Turbo, uh, or I'm sorry, the Razor Pro R coming out. Some of the things that just we'll, we'll talk on some topics real quick, what your thoughts are. Uh, so we've talked trailing arms. Uh, what do you think about the tow link? Uh, beefy, you know, those pictures that you dropped on it and stuff like that. It, it looks, it looks pretty phenomenal. You know, I'm, uh, I'm all about just building a bulletproof grenade proof car. It's cause it's been my, in my history, it's been very difficult to do so. I mean, you know, you know how well I think of my car. Like I love my X3, but let's let's call it what it is. It's seen some downtime, you know? Uh, there's been seen some downtime from some stuff that I've destroyed on it, some stuff that other people have destroyed on it. And uh, some of that stuff probably could have been avoided with uh, tougher OE parts. Right. And a lot of that was fixed in the 22 models, right? That just mm -hmm. came out. But um, so we got the tow link uh, going in, which Polaris has never had. They've always had the dual radius arms with nothing else besides the trailing arm. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. One interesting part of that and the way that that all works is there's a whole new rear knuckle. Uh, the front knuckles are, new, are updated as well because of the new suspension, but the rear um, in the teaser, something that not a lot of people realize is the hub uh, we've, we've mentioned before, it went to a five lug hub, right? So we're going to see that come out, but they went to a two piece barrier carrier carrier. So now there's the hub, the bearing and a bearing carrier that then gets bolted to the knuckle. 
And that is very reminiscent of what we'll see in like class 10 trucks and things like that. Uh, but what's even more interesting, I was talking with a guy online the other day. It, it looks almost exactly like my wife's Chevy Aveo from that she used to have where there's a barrier carrier, a bearing carrier that then gets mated to the, to the hub. And that has to, that process is a double sleeve, right? There's a, there's a side coming over both ends, which means if you want to press it out, you almost have to be destructive in it. Yeah. Ha- having uh, replaced bearings on Chevy trucks and stuff like that, it's all one assembly. So it's actually very simple, mm-hmm. you know, very simple to remove and, and fix. So maybe that was their thought process. Maybe it's strength related, but it looks like it's going to be a hell of a lot tougher than it has been in the past. It's definitely be, there's a lot more material there now. And on the previous Pro XPs, one of their big problems initially was the bearings moving and having to get reseated, Loctited, and a bunch of other fix me's to get that sorted out. So it'll be nice to see a bigger, beefier, stronger barrier bearing setup. Uh, but that what that does is it creates more strength, more reliability in that rear section of the car. So yeah. uh, also the wheelbase in the car is going to be out. I mean, we're talking another six inches longer or, or maybe in that range because the center of the wheel is now closer to the muffler than ever before. So that'll be interesting um, to see how that de- plays out. It's going to destroy whoops. Oh, it's going to be awesome. In it's going to be insane. Now, yeah. here's here's a question. How long is a four-seater? Do uh, we, does it turn into an X3 Max length car? Probably. Probably. I think that's very interesting to me. I yeah. mean, I, I love four-seaters. I've always said I'm a four-seater guy. Uh, but having driven an X3 Max and how long that thing feels, um, it'd be interesting to see how a Polaris version of that would would feel on an actual play it out. Yeah, the uh, the... Pro that we have, the four seater pro that we have, feels. I, I you know, I'm, it feels long, but not like a max. Not like a max. A max, <laughs> a max feels like a turd back there, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just you just really notice it is all. And uh, you, as a, as the driver, swing out a lot sure, further, big time. Whereas the pro, the pro is pretty manageable. You know, it, it it feels it feels long, but it's not it's not something too crazy. But yeah, I, I'm I'm really interested to see what the extra wheelbase does for the uh, the two liter. Um, I can tell you, just I mean, the way that the industry is going right now with more power, more travel, wider. Um, when I went out on a test session with MTS while we were at Utah, and they were helping me dial in the MT, the the tune that they did on the suspension. So you combine that with the power that my car has now, for the first time. I was going through gnarly whoops and I was able to double them just boing, boing. And I'd have them timed perfectly. And there was a couple of them I even tripled. You're going to get OE cars that'll dang near be able to do that, you know, and you have to have a lot of power and you have to have it like right now to be able to do that. And I wouldn't be surprised if this two liter will do it. I mean, mind you, it kind of looks like that car might wind up being about 1800 pounds or more from the factory, but it, it is really exciting. And, and if there's one thing that I love, it's a machine that you can tackle whoops at just stupid speeds. And I think this, this two seater is going to be a beast. Yeah. And when you, especially when you talk about this shock upgrades and things like that, now I'm, I posted a picture on the shocks that um, it looks like it's a three spring shock tender, low rate, high rate. Yeah. I saw Robbie posted a picture of that too. Yeah, so, so Robbie <laughs> keeps pointing out this whole patent thing, and I and I went and looked it up, and he does have an issued patent for that setup, where a shock attaches to a lower arm. Um, I thought maybe it was just in an application state, not a awarded state, but it appears like it was awarded um, from what I saw last night. But uh, I think I think Polaris doing the uh, the shock um, eyelet over the axle is going to be what you know is their workaround on that one. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about the axle going through the shock? Remains to be seen, honestly. I, I don't... Uh, people much smarter than I do design these <laughs> things, so I guess we'll see. You know, Yeah, it's it, interesting. It, For those that haven't seen it yet or, or understand what's going on, the shock itself is l- mounted to the lower A-arm, and then the axle, instead of going in front of it or behind it like you know the speed car does, uh, or like some of the Yamaha upgrades do, um, the shock is, or the axle is going through the eyelet of the shock uh, shock mounting area, and it's kind of cradling the axle. So if the potential is that if you blow an axle, um, that thing might be flopping around inside your shock eyelet and take your shock out, right? And then you have a worse day than you did. You might have a um, you know end of a race versus a thirty minute fix. Potentially, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how they've come around that. Maybe they just upgraded all of it. Maybe it's all just not 
going to be, you know, a consumable anymore. Yeah, a lot of, you know, I, I was kind of kidding around there with the uh, Robbie Patton uh, comment there. But when we were at Utah, there's, there really was no shortage of Wildcats out there, double X's. There's yeah, there's that, plenty. There were some that were very custom too. And when you see that beefy front steer bar, when you see that freaking shock lo- mounted the lower A arm, like I'm like, and you, oh, and you, especially when you see the trailing arms, <laughs> like you look at those, <laughs> Rob, what, you know, what Robbie had patented on that car and you're just looking at it and going, man, this thing was so close to being a badass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was no, so he was close. definitely limited by the corporate for sure. calls on that for one, sure. for that, sure. And that's why I'm excited about his car. You know, you've hopped in it now. I hopped in it at Sancho and, uh, uh, he has a very strong cheerleader in me because if if that thing comes out and it's as badass as it looks like it's going to be, it's going to be unreal. It'd be, it'll be a car to have for sure. It's going to be awesome. I've, I've talked to a number of people about that car and, you know, what to expect and if it's even something to be considering buying on its first release, right? Um, and I think that the question isn't on the car itself. I think the chassis design, the... You know, the bulkheads, all those things are great design choices, all come from experience, you know, over those racing career. Um, you know, all those things I think are great ideas, the, the dash and all that stuff that they're doing, all great things. Um, I think the car is undisputably probably the best chassis on the market once it does come out. Sure. Uh, the question that I have and the reliability issues I'm concerned about are with the motor and the trans and how that all works. Or how the aftermarket supports the car, you know. Or if they're allowed to. Because if you can't get parts, it, it's, it creates problems, you know? Well, with the Articat, I mean, you, couldn't, you weren't allowed to build on it because right. of, of all the patent stuff. So, right. Yeah, if there's one thing that I really love about Robbie's car is, like, if you go look at those trailing arms and then go look at, like, Nick Eisenhower's, uh, I don't know what class Nick Eisenhower's truck is in. I should know, but I don't know. Like, the trailing arms on that big old Ford are very similar to the trailing arms on the Speed UTV. You know, very similar uh, design, very similar look to it. And uh, that's a tried and true method in trophy truck racing, in desert racing. And that that car, uh, I'm telling you, man, it was so funny too because like he went out and you know, we haven't even talked about it yet. He he entered that car in Huckfest. Yeah. You know, he jumped the speed car in Huckfest. And, and when, you, when you watch the line that he chose, when you try, and when you watch how that car handled in the air... Uh, not the, on paddles either. Yeah, not on. Oh, that's the big thing too. He wasn't even on paddles, but like the car that won went like 143 feet. It's a very light car, and it's a car built to jump by a guy who knows how to do it. And he did a great job. He won the thing. You know, car out of shock. shock. Car was specifically built for, for sure. that event. Exactly for sure. Props to that dude. You and know. it was a YXE. And it was a YXE. And second place. Shout out to Colton, by the way. That's yeah, his name. yeah. And second place was taken down by almost a stock Can Am. It was taken down by a buddy of mine. And almost stock uh, can am, and that kid is fearless, you know, absolutely fearless. I told everybody, watch out for him. I've seen him jump before. Don't be surprised if he winds on the podium, he went second. And, uh, but Robbie's car, there wasn't any car out there that was handling landings as good as his car. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And, and there was a so couple, he got a lot of crap about his response to that, where they posted the video of comparing his car landing and not getting whiplash, and everybody else landing hard, hitting bottom, getting whiplash, and all that stuff. He's got some valid points there. His car floated off that landing. Yeah, no question about it. And and there was there were two to three cars that came down driver front tire first. Uh, two got annihilated. One had a major wreck, and another one actually pulled it off. Surprisingly, Robbie had a sa- similar kick on on his last jump, where he came down driver front driver uh, driver front first. You'd never notice. Like it totally ate it up. No problem at all. If, while you were there, you would never even said that it bottomed out. He yeah. dragged, he drug tail on those jumps when his bot, when he went nose down and his rear slapped the ground. But I can guarantee you, he never felt it. No, hundred percent. I it, I totally agree. Uh, oh, my battery. <laughs> Oopsie. Man, maybe you should get a Sony. Well, maybe we should figure out how to plug <laughs> this thing in. <laughs> 
So I'll just wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, it's been a long enough episode. Uh, we're excited for Tuesday. We're excited for the new Razor launch. Um, we're excited for new cars. We're excited for the new push into the industry and to expand the industry. Uh, super excited about how awesome this year's events went. Uh, everybody that came out and said hi and took pictures and, and participated in the events. Thanks for showing up and uh, shaking hands and doing all that stuff. Uh, hope everybody had a great year at these events. Uh, hope everybody has a great uh week with these new product launches uh and uh we're looking forward to seeing what happens um the aftermarket and uh we can't wait to get our our seat time in these cars so until the next time guys peace